So jumping right in, the reason I wanted to make this video is because obviously I think it's a, a needed topic to cover, but I don't know how popular it's going to be because, you know, warning ahead, normally when somebody's in a breakup, the truth is they don't like no contact. Even if you kind of jump in and understand the principle and understand why pursuit and pleading and begging hasn't worked, and you can kind of identify that reasoning in your mind, emotionally, it's still very powerful. You still want to chase. I mean, we've all, been, we've all been programmed with this idea that I just need to let that other person know. I need to remind them of how they felt. I need to remind them of how good we are together. The best way to do that is if I can show them how much I love them, it'll remind them how much they love me. That'll remind them how much we love each other and how we're supposed to be together. Especially if you did something to cause the breakup, you think, well, the key isn't to walk away. Every day they're further away from me, I'm getting further away from them and it's becoming more hopeless. So even if you intellectually understand the principles of no contact, emotionally, you're going to have this compulsion to chase, to plead. So if you can get under control enough to do no contact, the last thing you want to do is do something that might be labeled extreme no contact, which is the point of this video. So just hear me out. So the first thing I should do is explain what extreme no contact is. In normal no contact, you don't really want to block social media. You don't want to like kind of cut off with friends. You don't want to do anything that, that kind of gives off the impression that you're kind of closing every door. No contact is, you know, you go radio silent, you pull back, you don't reach out, but you don't necessarily put blockades up. As a matter of fact, in regular no contact, you definitely don't want to put blockades up. You want to make as many doors open as you can, as long as you're not in pursuit. So what I mean by extreme no contact, and maybe that sounds a little scary, so maybe somebody give me some ideas to, to name it something else if that sounds too scary. But what I'm talking about is when you unfollow and you block, like you block the phone number, you block the email, you block on social media. If you have common friends, you tell the common friends, hey, I don't have anything against them. I'm not angry at them, but I don't really want to talk about them. I don't want to get updates about them. And when you say that, you know there's a high likelihood, if it's a shared or common friend, that it's going to get back to them. If you work with them and you tell a fellow coworker, now it's fine. I'm not mad at them, but I don't really want to talk about it. I'm kind of, I've, I've moved on. I wish, I wish him or her nothing but the best, but I'm, I'm good. But what extreme no contact isn't, I'm not saying that you need to write them a letter and tell them to, you know, go to hell. I'm not trying to tell you to reach out to them and slam and weld the door shut. But extreme no contact is you closing the door. But to try to provide a little bit of clarity, it's, it's like, it's like you're closing the doors, but you're not locking them. You're closing the doors, but you're not welding them shut. It's almost like if your heart is a house, you have a wall around it. That's what extreme no contact is. But it's not a very high wall. It's like a five or six foot wall. It's one that if they really realize they made a mistake and they miss you and they want to be with you again, is there a wall there? Yes. Is it climbable? Yes. And let me give you a real life example of it. So it was a client I had and it wasn't too long ago and the breakup was, it got pretty painful. He actually chased and pleaded for a few weeks and he actually got some good success. In other words, there were times that she would talk to him. There were times that they went out again. But even though during those few weeks, he was having some success of spending time with her and her being somewhat open to the idea of getting back together, ultimately, she would always, within like 24 or 48 hours, say, no, I don't want this. So by the time he actually played out the pursuit, the begging and the pleading, it got to the point that she actually said, if you reach out to me again, even though I know you're not a threat, I'll get a restraining order because I really do need to move on. And I'm sorry to threaten you with that, but I think unless I do threaten you with that, we're just going to keep doing this. Like, I, I don't want you showing up at my house. I don't want you reaching out to me. So by the time he came to me and told me that, he didn't really have a choice but to do extreme no contact. Which leads me into my first example of a situation where you want to employ extreme no contact. If somebody's mentioning a restraining order, if somebody's threatening to call the police, if somebody starts recording you, as evidence of how crazy you're acting. Like, those are all really strong situations. And one of two things is the case. Either you really are a danger and you really are a problem and you really do need to go into no contact in an extreme version where you block and separate as much as you can for your sake and for theirs. Or they're misrepresenting you. They're vilifying you. They're framing you as a danger that you aren't. In which case, you still need to go in extreme no contact. Because when they start using those kind of serious legal words and legal threats, and then for any reason, mentioning that they feel like they're in danger, whatever the cause, whether it's warranted and you're the problem or you know you're not a problem and you know they know you're not a problem, it doesn't matter. When those words are uttered, not only pull back, but you need to pull back and regain a sense of strength, regain a sense of self-respect that tells that other person, if you're going to threaten me or mention those kind of words, I don't need to be in your life. You've reframed me to a dangerous degree and I don't need it. 
it's not good for either one of us. You need to be able to project that kind of strength, even if in the moment you, you're overwhelmed. Now, I, I understand a lot of you are watching this right now saying, well, that's common sense. Yeah, it seems like common sense until you're there. But a lot of people never imagine they're going to be threatened with something like a restraining order because they know they've never done or said anything that warrants it. But sometimes it comes out anyway. And when you're really in heartbreak, you can justify it. Like there are a lot of people I've talked to that have said, look, I know she knows that I'm not a danger. I know he knows I'm not a danger, but then they'll rationalize it. I think that they're just really upset right now, so I need to back off. But as much as it seems like I wouldn't need to make a video saying this, I have some patience and understanding if you're watching this. There are people that they kind of hear those terms thrown out, those legal terms thrown out. And because they know they're not a threat and they trust the other person deep down knows that they're not a threat, they think it's still safe to keep interaction going. It's not. You have to look at it like this. She knows that she mentioned that word. She knows she just actually threatened legal action. If you go over that and keep trying to reach out to her, you could not project more desperation. You're not proving loyalty. All you're showing her is that even if you threaten me legally, I'm so incapable of living without you that I have to ignore that comment. I have to keep trying. That doesn't project strength. That doesn't trigger reattraction. All that does is signal to them, and it should signal to you, that you've overinvested your sense of worth, that you've actually kind of become desperate, that you might even need to go get some counseling. Because if somebody threatens you with legal action, you really need to step away. But you can get so wrapped up into it. Like there's a client I have right now, he's just one of the sweetest guys in the world, and it hasn't been the strong legal action, but she did mention to her lawyer while they're separating from everything that he's been harassing her. You don't want words like harassment being uttered to a lawyer who might find a way to utter it to a judge. So if, you heard, if you've had anything like this, as much as this sounds like a common sense kind of thing, you can find yourself caught up in the emotion and willing to rationalize things that you shouldn't. So by the time you reached out to me, I said, all right, if she's mentioned that word, the first thing you need to do is prove to her that she's safe. And by proving to her that she's safe, you're also proving to her that you're capable of living without her. Right now, if she's threatened legal action, she doesn't think you're capable of living without her. She thinks you're desperate to be with her enough that she's threatening to get the law involved. Show her that you're capable of living without her. Show her that you're capable of being independent from her and drop her on social media. Drop her, block her, block her number, block her email. It's going to do two things. It's going to let her know that you're not in pursuit, which lets her know she's got some time and space and she feels safe. Maybe part of her legitimately does feel concerned. And if there is any part of her that's legitimately concerned. You need to reassure her that you're not a danger. The second thing it does is it projects strength and lets you reclaim a sense of self-worth, awareness, and resilience. And you need both of those things very much right now. So he did it. Now, when you're doing extreme no contact by blocking on social media and by blocking phone and by blocking email, what you're doing, look at it like this. Look at no contact like being with you is, is like a house. I really like the house metaphor, right? Well, now instead of having the doors open, you've got all the doors shut, but they're not locked. They're not welded shut, right? But you have put a little wall up, which is strong enough and tangible enough that you're really projecting this idea that, hey, not only do I not need to be with you, I'm prepared to not be with you. Like I'm putting things there that let you know I'm putting separation between you and me. I don't plan on you being in my life anymore. But it's like a five or six foot tall wall. What I mean by that is they can climb over it. Like in that example that I'm giving, it took about three months. But when this guy did that, he started focusing on himself. He started focusing on a project, a purpose, or a plan that was more central to who he was and gave him a greater sense of meaning and identity than the feelings of the woman that he was still in love with. And it took three months, and he was really focused on it. And the whole time, it felt like it wasn't going to work. So after three months, his ex actually set up another email account, a separate email account. Like, he still had his existing phone number. He still had his existing social media profiles and everything else. He just had her blocked to project that strength. So she set up another email account and emailed him through that. And that's how she contacted him. And they ended up talking. They actually ended up getting engaged. So they did overcome it. That's not the normal outcome when somebody started mentioning restraining orders. But in this case, it worked. But it never would have worked if he had just kind of kept obsessed with her. Because it was dominating his day. It was dominating his thoughts. And it was making it impossible for him to actually project the strength that drew her back in the first place. So point two is if it's really impacting your functionality. So th that might sound simple. And we all kind of can delude ourselves, lie to ourselves. In the moment, it's almost like when you're getting over somebody, it really is a lot like a drug addiction or withdrawal. 
It's like trying to get over alcohol or heroin gets a lot of the good comparisons. And it's, it's a true comparison. The same part of your brain that activates when you're going through heroin withdrawal activates when you're going through a breakup. So one of the big aspects to look at to know if you need to actually up the no contact and put more of a wall between you and them is how much is it impacting your functionality. If every time you wake up, you have this pit in your stomach that's telling you, I need to check their Facebook. I need to check their Instagram. I need to see what they, I need to see what they did. Did they gain a new follower? I need to check their Spotify. Did they make a new playlist? I need to check their Venmo. Did they go out? Who did they pay? I mean, if, if you're in that obsessive state and it's really impacting your functionality, then you need to put that wall there for two reasons. Number one, it projects strength even if you don't feel it, like it, it'll actually project the exact opposite of the truth sometimes. Like you might actually be obsessed. And some of the most impressive, some of my favorite people, some of my favorite clients actually fall into this category because a lot of times high intelligence, um, high intensity, high sensitivity, high focus, high creativity, all those things are great and they serve you well in life. But after a breakup, all that intelligence and creativity and outside the box thinking, it's going to give you all these different ways to spy on your ex. The more ways you have, the more likely you are to as soon as you wake up and before you go to bed at night, I'm going to check and see what I can find out. And you start pulling in all these little pieces of information, all these little peeks into their life that you can. The logic behind that is telling you, if I can get more information, I can make a better plan. If I make a better plan, I have a better chance of winning them back. Who could argue with that logic? The problem is it's logical and a relationship isn't as logical as it feels. So you're really setting yourself up for what I call the chaos chain. What happens is you'll do enough information seeking to find, oh, they did go out with somebody. Oh, they did just get a new follower. Oh, they just did this. And based on that little information, you'll create an entire world that seems true. And it's usually a little bit more pessimistic. It's usually a little bit darker. It's usually a little bit less hopeful, but you'll create this world that you'll then convince yourself of based on limited information. So like one of my favorite stories, they saw pictures online of their ex with their new boyfriend hanging out with her family and made the assumption that, well, if, if she's going to invite them to hang out with her family and it was on a Sunday and I know Sunday is a big family day for them. If my ex has invited this new guy to spend time with her family, then this is get, This must be serious. They're probably going to get engaged. I bet I'm about to see an announcement online. Well, he ended up spending two weeks really worried about this convinced that his ex was in love and serious about another guy because he saw the pictures online. It turned out that she was a special needs teacher that was actually spending time with somebody that had nothing to do with anything romantic, but he spent two weeks tormenting himself. So sometimes some of the most impressive, intelligent, and creative clients that I have will spend so much time obsessed trying to pull in information. The reason you feel that compulsion is because it's worked in your life. You know, when you go to college and you set a goal, you're going to earn this degree, you're going to get this job, you're going to get this promotion, you're going to start this business, it works. So when you start to, you start off with that same problem solving mentality, but it doesn't work as much in relationships because we're not as logical as we think we are. But that habit of problem solving mentality in relationships and breakups is a really powerful one. So listen, if, if this sounds like you, if you can't think about anything else before you go to sleep and you have trouble going to sleep and then you have a dream about them and then you wake up and you've got a pit in your stomach. So the first thing you do is you get online and you check messages. And the next thing you do is check her profile or check his Instagram or check whatever you check. And you probably have these very creative. As a matter of fact, if you want to leave it in the comment section, the most creative things you've done to get information. Most of my clients will say something like this. I know I shouldn't. I feel a little bit like a stalker, but I did this fill in the blank. And it can be anything from I drove by their house to I borrowed a friend's car to drive by their house to I hired a detective. But there's all these little ways that make you feel connected. The truth is part of what's driving you to do all this little investigation and to pull all these little pieces and to peek into their life as much as you can is that it's still a connection. Your pain is a connection. Knowing what they're doing, you're still a part of their life. It's a painful way to be a part of their life. But on some level, they're still in your life. Look at the desire to peek in on their lives and pull in information. That's not going to give you a better plan. It's actually going to make you obsessed enough. The anxiety is going to be high enough. The inability to actually move on is being hampered. Your ability to project strength, your ability to trigger reattraction through living out a more successful, a more focused life and showing how much better you are at being you. Remember, the more focused you are on them, the harder it is for you to actually focus on projecting a stronger version of yourself. It's going to be harder for you to find the energy and the bandwidth to go work out, to start that new project, to focus on yourself and to learn how to fall in love with yourself 
while you're still hyper focused on them. So if it sounds like you and you're thinking to yourself, I just need to see, hopefully they're not with somebody. Okay, good. There's no pictures of them with somebody else. Oh, good. Their relationship status hasn't changed. All right, let me see if I can figure out where they went. And you find yourself kind of pulled in and absorbed for, I don't know, anywhere from 10 minutes to four hours in your day. This applies to you. You need to go in a stronger version of no contact because you're not going to be able to project strength effectively if you're allowing yourself to be hyper and overly focused on that other person. It actually kind of gives you walls of your own sanity. It forces you to look at yourself. It forces you to work on yourself, which is actually very attractive. And a lot of times it actually projects the idea that you're strong enough to move on. Number three, if they're dating someone else. If they've been with somebody else for a while, but you could just find them still contacting you, what they're doing is using you for training wheels to not only get over you, but to help build this connection with them because you're accidentally training them to believe that you don't need the minimal boundary of respect. You're training them to believe that they can be with somebody else and then still sneak an email or call or meet up with you. You're not going to win them back that way because even in the moment, you might feel like you're strong. You might feel like you're still kind of blowing on the embers of that flame until it becomes a roaring fire again but it's not happening. If you're allowing that contact, whether with somebody else, look at it this way. This is their ego right here. They have you that at some point they thought of as high value and they must still put some value on you because they're reaching out to you and they have the new person. So you've got two people feeding that ego until it's overflowing. People tend not to move from that position. People like feeling wanted. They like feeling pursued. And if they have two people giving them that sense of importance and value, why would they step away from that? They're not going to do it because it's quote unquote the right thing to do. If they cared about the right thing to do, they wouldn't be in that situation. They wouldn't be reaching out to you continuously. So you really have to kind of trigger. And a lot of times people don't understand this. You're missing out on a chance to really trigger reattraction by telling them no. You don't have to, again, you don't have to be rude, but if they keep reaching out and they're with somebody else, just reassure them. This sounds strange and it's not a very well-known thing, but if you reassure somebody who's kind of demonstrating or articulating hesitancy about the breakup, like if they reach out to you and say, I know I shouldn't be reaching out to you. I'm with somebody else. It's not fair to you and it's not fair to them, but I just can't help myself and I'm sorry. It's really easy for you to say, hey, I understand. I feel the same way. I'm just happy to hear from you. But that's not actually going to drive up attraction. If on the other hand, you reassure them, which sounds strange, but if you say, I understand, I miss you too, but we both know that we're not together right now and it's not respectful of your current relationship. And I think we just need to give each other time. I know how scary that sounds. I know how scary it is to say, but when you say something like, Hey, listen, I miss you too. So you're not shooting them down. You're not insulting them, but we were together for a while. We had a really good connection. We still have chemistry, but the truth is, it's just going to take us a while to get used to not being in each other's lives. What you just did was reassure them. Well, to reassure them, you have to have strength. So you're projecting strength and now you're giving them a real sense of loss. So go back to this, this example. If their ego is here and you say, you know what? The truth is, we just always had a good connection, but we need to just get used to the idea that we're not going to be in each other's lives because you realized you don't want to be with me. Now you're unplugging from overflowing that ego. And now you're the one showing the strength to walk away. That ego is going to be more preoccupied by the person strong enough to leave than they are grateful for the person who stayed because people are made up more of ego than logic. So reassure them if they're with somebody else, but then say, you know, I think it's probably best until we put some time between us that we don't talk to each other. That's when you block them. That's when you block your, the email, you block the phone, you block the social media, and you really project a strength that you might not feel. Have you put a wall there? Yes. But again, it's a scalable wall. To get over that wall, all they need to possess is the awareness that they want to be with you and the willingness to actually project that and express it to you. That's all they need to do to go over that wall. You're not putting up a skyscraper and a moat filled with like alligators and rabid dogs and evil mother-in-laws. No, you're just putting up a reasonable wall. Think of that wall as your self-respect. Think of that wall as your as a metaphor of your strength. It's not so tall they can't get over it, but what they have to do to get over it is have the intention of being with you. So it's a healthy thing. And that leads into the fourth example of when to go in extreme no contact. Maybe they aren't dating somebody else, but maybe they've been breadcrumbing you now for a couple of months. If somebody after a breakup has taken two or three months and they don't let you go completely, maybe they keep calling you to check on you. Maybe they keep reaching out and saying, I know it's not fair, but I really miss you. Or I'm glad we stayed friends. Or so they're just keeping you just connected enough to keep you preoccupied 
to keep that connection warm and painful, but they're not actually closing that distance. It's not actually working. They can kind of keep you breadcrumbed and just kind of keep you in their orbit or that metaphor I like to use. It's like their heart is like a house and they like to keep you on the porch because as close as you are, they don't have a real sense of loss. They always know you're kind of a, a ready and waiting backup plan. They're using you for training wheels to learn how to live life without you. Anytime it gets too hard because they remember that connection and they remember how much they enjoy your company, they reach out to you. So that anxiety and that sense of loss from not being with you anymore, it gets taken care of. It gets relieved. But they're getting what they need from you, but you're not getting what you need from them. So if you've been in that state for a couple of months and they just keep kind of leading you on, but they're not actually making any kind of significant move, what do you do? Well, project more strength. Remember, the key to reattraction is projecting that you're either strong enough, intriguing enough, exceptional enough, that you have something about your life that's greater than them being the center of it. Well, you project that kind of strength even when you don't feel it by showing that you're independent, that you're resilient, that you're capable of moving on. So if they've been leading you on for a while, show, show more strength. Don't show more desperation. Don't act grateful for the morsels. Instead, act like, you know, I need more than this. And we're not going to be together. That's fine. I'm not mad at you. Don't be mad. Don't be sad. Both of those things are bad. It's a little rhyme that might help. Resilience, strength, and purpose. Those are attractive. So sometimes to do that, if they've been leading you on too long, show more strength. That's what reattracts somebody. You show more strength by just reassuring them into going away. Hey, I really liked talking to you too. I'm glad we're still friends and I'm always going to have warm feelings for you. But we should probably stop doing this because we both need to get used to the idea that we're not in each other's lives anymore. Reassure them, as scary as it is for you, it sounds different to them. When they don't expect you to project more strength, when they expect you to just be more grateful for the time that they give you, and suddenly you're showing that resilience and that self-confidence, that creates confusion, it creates a sense of loss, it's a wound to their ego, and it makes them wanna re-examine what they're about to really lose. So it's a scary thing to do, but it's an attractive thing for them to hear. And this last scenario is one of the scarier situations to be in and one of the more confusing. And that's when, let's say you have a short amount of time. A lot of times this will happen with clients that are on the verge of a divorce or they've lived together for a long time and now they're moving out. Maybe they're about to sell the house. But whatever the time frame is, maybe the divorce is about to go final. So you feel like, all right, things have been somewhat warm. We've, we've kind of stayed in each other's lives, but this divorce is coming up. This move out date is coming up, uh, this moving out of the country, whatever it is, if you're on a shorter timeline, as illogical as it might sound and as unnatural as it might feel, if you're working with a much shorter time frame, it's even more imperative that you more quickly project more strength. I've seen so many clients accidentally hold the hands of the person that's leaving them because maybe they're getting that divorce or they're coming up on a timeline and they think, I have just enough connection. I need to find a way to build this up. I need to find a way to fan this flame into a roaring fire again, right? Like if you have a shorter amount of time period, that other person's going to know it too. So they'll let you hold their hand all the way to that date. It's the easiest thing for them. But you can let that situation work for you. Like let's say that you know that that person, maybe the divorce is going to be final in two weeks. Or maybe you know they're going to fly away. Whatever the situation is, you got two weeks. They know that they have two weeks. So what's easier? Are you going to like hold their hand and kind of give them the emotional reassurance and protect them from any sense of loss all the way up to the edge of the cliff when it's too late? You don't want that last day that you have together to be the first moment that they understand what living life without you feels like. Then it's too late. So let's say you have two weeks. Well, I want them to get the full impact of my absence as soon as I can. So that's when you want to do more extreme no contact. That's when you want to block them. Again, don't do it out of anger. Don't do it out of heartbreak. And don't do it out of rage. Do it out of resilience and strength and determination in a sense that you know who you are and you know what your value is. So take the approach of, listen, since we already know we're not going to be together, we should start getting used to the idea. Again, use the reassurance tactic. But now give them the full impact of your absence because now they have two weeks. Two weeks to imagine that the rest of their lives, this is what it's going to feel like. And it's also going to catch them off guard. And one of the one of the handy tactics or one of the handy principles to keep in mind is that anytime somebody's given you a consistent sense of value and worth over a consistent amount of time and then they withdraw it, it's part of human nature. It's not something that I'm just taking a guess at. I didn't discover it. It's part of human nature. 
And when somebody's giving you that consistent sense of value and they withdraw it, it triggers this self-examination. Why don't, why are they treating me differently? Am I not as good as they thought I was? Am I not as attractive as they thought I was? What changed? Why do, why do they seem okay letting me go now? They have two weeks with me. Why aren't they trying to win me back? It gives them a taste of what the rest of their life is going to look like. You want them to experience that loss while they have time to stop it. You want them to experience and see you with that new level of strength while there's still time for them to stop it. But if you nurse them, nurture them, and kind of give them an emotional escort on the way out of the relationship, they're not going to get that sense of loss until they're gone. So give them that, give them that loss. Let them see that you have the strength to project the resilience and determination to live without them. That's what really triggers that compulsion to reanalyze. It's an extension of the same principle that makes it a good idea not to reach out during a birthday, an anniversary, or some emotional moment. Because if you have an opportunity to spend time with them, if you have a justification to reach out and you don't take it, that projects more strength, which triggers more attraction. If somebody just broke up with you and their birthday's coming up, don't reach out and say happy birthday. Don't give them the emotional benefit of being with you when they're not with you. It's the same thing if you're on a limited time frame. So if you're in a situation that involves a countdown, use every moment to your fullest advantage. Look at it this way. You have less time to project strength and trigger reattraction. So you have to take advantage of those moments. Don't make it easy on them. So I hope this helps. Those are the situations where I really recommend taking your no contact up a notch or what I call extreme no contact. It's not really that extreme, so I should rename it. So help me come up with a better term. But again, it's like you're putting up a wall around your own heart, around your own sense of self-respect, your own sense of value. It's a five or six foot wall, but it's a wall that they can get over as long as they have the intention and the desire to. Again, it's not a 10 foot wall. It's just five or six foot. They can get over that. If they want to be with you bad enough, if they want to be with you enough to stick with you, then they're going to find a way to get over the wall. All it requires is calling from another phone number, setting up another email, setting up another social media profile, whatever it is. So you're not moving the house. You're just projecting strength to let them know that it takes somebody of value to get back to you. So having said all that, I know every situation is different. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching calls. So if I can be of use or if your situation is just unique enough that you're not exactly sure where it might fit, then you can find me at DoTheyLoveMe.com and I'd love the chance to talk to you. Please leave your, your comments and ideas for maybe a different name for Extreme No Contact and kind of let me know examples that you've lived out, that you've seen these principles at play in your own situation. So thanks a lot and I'll talk to you again soon.